Now I would like to thank Archaeology Southwest for inviting me here to talk. I'm really looking forward to hearing you guys' questions and hopefully being able to have a little bit of discussion about the material that I'm going to talk to you guys about today. So in 1749, Thomas Velez Cachapin became the governor of New Mexico. Now the world that Cachapin enters into is a world of chaos. For the past 40 years, the Comanche have been relentlessly raiding Spanish and Hanisero settlements across the colony. Comanche raiding had essentially left New Mexico's economy stagnant. One year after Cachapin takes office, a group of Comanches, about 130 men, come to Taos asking to trade. They're trading hides and captives, and they make an agreement with Cachapin to go about their business peacefully. Although those leaders agreed to Cachapin's term, a month later, a band of about 145 Comanches come to Pecos and raid the settlement. Enraged, Cachapin is losing his mind. He sets out against this group of Comanches to retaliate. After six days in pursuit, the governor finally catches up to them in a box canyon where the Comanche had retreated onto a frozen pond. Cachapin orders his men to set fire to the reeds surrounding the pond, and he begins firing. Through the haze of smoke and guns, the cries of women and children ring out through the night. At midnight, a young boy brings a cross made out of reeds to Cachapin asking for salvation. Others soon follow. At daybreak, Cachapin has 49 captives, he has over 100 horses and mules, and the rest of the 145 Comanches are dead. Keeping four prisoners as hostage, Cachapin releases the rest, making them promise to establish a peace with New Mexico. This encounter is known as the Battle of San Diego Pond, and it gave Cachapin a formidable advantage with the Comanche because he established himself as a superior warrior. The relative harmony that Cachapin had established under his rule quickly fell apart when Governor Pedro Mandaneta came to office in 1767. So for the next 12 years, New Mexico was plunged back into war. So what kind of lesson can we take from this kind of tragic story of San Diego Pond? On the one hand, the story can be interpreted as evidence for the superiority of Western military might. Armed with guns and steel, Cachapin's forces were able to easily defeat the more primitive bow and arrow of the Comanche, despite the fact that the Comanches had significant numbers. This interpretation is very much in line with what I would call the Jared Diamond model of thinking. Show of hands here, who's read Jared Diamond's famous book, Guns, Germs, and Steel? All right, very good. So Diamond's driving question in his book comes from an encounter with a Papua New Guinea man named Yali, who asks Diamond, why is it that you white people developed so much cargo and brought it to New Guinea, but we black people had little cargo of our own? Diamond's question limits the type of story that we can tell about human history. And focusing on these instances where Western microbes defeated indigenous people and technologies advanced, Diamond rigs the answer to Yali's question. His story in Guns, Germs, and Steel provides evidence for what seems to be a foregone conclusion. The West is the best. The West beat the rest. In other words, Diamond only looks for moments of Western success, and not for moments of failure. For those times when non-Western indigenous civilizations successfully outnumbered, outmaneuvered, and outperformed the West. So today, I'm going to change the terms of the question. Instead of looking for explanations for why European powers were so successful, I want to ask a different question. I want to ask why and when did indigenous groups triumph over the West? In order to answer this question, we need to look for alternative histories. Events which reflect those times when the North American continent was controlled by and thrived under indigenous rulers. Now, these moments are notoriously hard to find if we just stick to the archival record. 
a record which for all intents and purposes is written by the enemy and really largely reflects Western perspectives and priorities. Instead, today, I'm going to focus on the archaeological record and what that record can tell us about those moments when the West utterly and profoundly failed. In order to do that, I want to focus in on New Mexico, specifically during the 18th century. And I want to talk about the Comanche. I want to subject them to the same criteria that Diamond uses, guns, germs, and steel. I want to see how they fare using the archaeological evidence, primarily rock art, collected from New Mexico in association with the Rio Grande Gorge project. Now, undertaking this daunting task in a mere 40 minutes, I want to make a disclaimer. The disclaimer is, you may leave this talk thinking Diamond was right. But we're in it together now, so let's, let's have a shot. So before we get into this, I just want to catch everybody up to speed in case you never heard of the Comanche, who they are, where they came from. I'm going to give a, just a real quick overview to catch us all up. So basically, pre-contact Comanche are a kind of generalized group of hunter-gatherers associ linguistically associated with groups like the Shoshone, the Paiute, and the Ute. And they were occupying the Great Basin and Rocky Mountains directly to the north and northwest of Taos. So over the 16th century, the Comanche split from the Shoshone, and they started to migrate south along the Eastern Front Range. Once on the Southern Plains, the Comanche come into contact with a formidable group of Plains Apaches living on the Eastern Plains, and who were already thriving as part of a kind of mutualistic exchange with the Northern Pueblos of Taos, Pickeries, and Pecos. Armed with horses and metal, these Apache groups were able to force the Comanche back out into the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, where the Comanches kind of take refuge with their linguistically related uh, Ute cousins, who then go about introducing them to New Mexico's trade markets. The Pueblo Revolt is a kind of critical moment in the kind of ethnogenesis of the Comanche, if you want to think about it that way. So basically, during the Spanish absence from New Mexico, that 12-year absence, the Comanche and a lot of other groups gain access to horses at a kind of unprecedented level, and the Comanche become highly efficient bison hunters. By 1700, Comanches were regularly taking horses and captives from the more sedentary Pueblo and Apache groups in the region. They do this largely with the help of their Ute allies, and they are able to successfully drive the Plains Apaches out of their homelands in the Arkansas River Valley and kind of basically into the arms of the Spanish who are waiting to missionize them. Fifty years later, the Comanche were an established political force on the Southern Plains. At the heart of the Comanche's power was a kind of dual strategy of raiding and trading, so diplomacy and violence. Okay, so now that we kind of know what the Comanche are doing, their kind of historical trajectory, I want to take a closer look at the evidence, and I want to start by looking at guns and steel. So for diamond, guns and steel are technologies that directly enabled Europeans to conquer the New World. Much of diamond's argument relies on an assumption that the development of agriculture and surplus was a kind of precursor to complexity. This is a kind of Agriculture basically sets in motion all that good stuff that we have today, like state-level societies, religion, stratification, writing, all those things that we think of as the hallmarks of the West. As mobile hunter-gatherers, the Comanche were already way behind the Spanish in this kind of race for technological development. This kind of domino effect logic precludes alternative pathways to complexity. In the case of 18th century New Mexico, it was precisely these features of state-level society that actually prevented the Spanish from successfully conquering the region. So to prove the point, I want to look at the four reasons that Diamond gives for why the, why the West usually beats the rest, why states triumph over hunter-gatherers. And he says it's because they have an advantage of weaponry, they have a numerical advantage, they have centralized decision-makers, and they have official religion and patriotic fervor. Let's start with advantages of weaponry. In New Mexico, guns were, were not widely available at all. And when they were available, the gunpowder that you needed to actually shoot the gun off 
was always in short supply. Indeed, there are dozens of accounts in the Spanish archives that lament how underfunded and undersupplied the state of New Mexico was. So in addition to being rare, flintlock guns that soldiers were primarily using during the 18th century were very cumbersome and highly inaccurate, causing long lag times between firing and having a firing range of only about 160 meters. The paucity of guns in New Mexico is reflected in the widespread absence of gun imagery within the rock art in the Rio Grande Gorge. Within our current sample of rock art, we only have two clear depictions of guns. We have hundreds and thousands of rock art panels. We only have two depictions of guns. Here is one of the rare occasions that we actually see a clearly defined gun being drawn by a Comanche artist. So what you're seeing here on the right side is an archaic panel. The pecking, the red pecking is archaic. And then over top of it, you can see a Comanche artist has come in and drawn several guns in the form of a detalli. And you can see that they're highly realistic, actually. If you look here on the right side, or left side, um, what you see is a Spanish Escapada musket for comparison. So this was a typical musket that the Spanish in the 18th century were using. So this situation begins to change after about 1760, when guns actually become widely available to the Comanche as well as a lot of other groups on the Northern Plains through trade with the French. In combination with speedy Spanish horses, French guns gave the Comanche a significant advantage over poorly armed Spanish troops. The influx of guns into the hands of Comanche raiders precipitated a notable shift in Spanish settlement patterns. So what I'm trying to get at here is the Spanish are reacting to the indigenous folks, not the other way around. So what happens in the 18th century is that the Spanish settlers begin to abandon their small dispersed ranches in favor of clustered villages or haciendas protected by torreones, what you might think of as watchtowers. The Martinez Hacienda, which you see here in Taos, is an excellent example of this uh, late 18th century development. And it was built in 1804 has thick adobe walls, has these kind of centralized courtyards, and it didn't have any windows on the outside. And these were all explicit developments to protect against Comanche raiders. So while guns only played a kind of small role in terms of actual combat in New Mexico, steel, on the other hand, is a major player. In many ways, steel swords gave the Spanish a significant advantage over indigenous people in the Southwest. They were less brittle than obsidian weapons. They were longer and sharper than clubs. Spaniards could fight for hours and receive only flesh wounds while killing dozens of indigenous people. And this strategy was effective for a while. Recognizing the power of Spanish steel, Comanches developed several strategies which ultimately gave them an upper hand in most 18th century conflicts. Comanches co-opted Spanish technologies for their own purposes during the early 18th century. Comanches, along with other indigenous groups, began developing steel points, like what you see here. These were often made from iron or steel, um, usually barrel hoops, using a combination of chisels, hammers, and sandstone sharpening tools. The Comanche made two different types of points. One was for war, one was for hunting. The one that they used for war actually had a barbed end so that it was much more difficult to take out. And they used this in concert with bows and arrows, which were de designed to shoot accurately up to 300 yards. So with these two technologies combined, the Comanche could pierce Spanish armor from great distances. From a young age, Comanche boys were trained to be able to shoot arrows with a high rate of fire at great accuracy, riding at full gallop. Until the advent of the Colt Walker revolver in 1847, the Comanche could basically outfire any Spanish soldier. In addition to developing metal point technology, the Comanche and other Plains tribes began producing horse armor. This was made out of leather, and it was a direct response to the kind of prevalence of steel weapons used in combat by the Spanish. 
So after the adoption of the horse in the 17th century, but before guns become widespread in the 1760s, many plains groups, including Apache, Ute, Comanche, employed armored cavalry techniques. So you can see these are, uh, this is a compilation of rock art imagery from across uh, the northern and southern plains, some compiled by Mark Mitchell in the Arkansas River Valley. Um, and what you see is there was kind of two different types of armor that was used. So one of them was this type with a kind of collar, an armored collar, and the other had no armored collar. At this juncture, it's unclear whether these kind of differences in style reflect distinct ethnic identities or preferences, or whether they were kind of changed over time. Either way, horse armor was used as part of what Sequoia has called the post-horse pre-gun military pattern, in which highly mobile leather-clad horses were ridden by leather-clad warriors with lances and short bows. The use of leather armor equipped with the high accuracy of bow and arrows gave indigenous groups like the Comanche a significant tactical advantage over massed infantry. In general, in the Rio Grande, we don't have a lot of evidence for this kind of use of horse tack, and that might just be because we haven't found it, or it might be because groups in the area weren't very using it very much. Either way, horse armor was really used in a pretty tight time period. It wasn't like a long-standing tradition. So we do have some preliminary evidence for it, what you see on this panel here, which you can see this figure has a kind of block-like armor in comparison to this other horse figure over here. You can see that the rider has this typical uh, small rounded shield that we see being developed after indigenous groups get the horse. So in addition to producing metal projectile points and leather armor, Comanches gained a significant military advantage over the Spanish using their own unique brand of equestrian warfare. So in pre-horse times, combat typically involved kind of set pieces between masked infantry who carried large shields and were armed with bows and arrows and spears. After the horse, combat is transformed into these fluid style skirmishes using lances, short bows designed for rapid fire, those kind of circular shields that I showed you, which were made out of uh, layers of bison hide being stretched over a kind of wooden frame. So an example of this kind of transitional moment in the kind of pre-horse, post-gun uh, military pattern is this rock art panel that you can see here. So on this side, you see an equestrian warrior. He's got his small little rounded shield. He's got his long lance. And then on the other side, you see a group, another group of pedestrian warriors with a kind of larger shield, lances, still practicing this kind of pedestrian style of warfare. Horses were integrated into Comanche society at a large scale by around 1720, if not earlier. With the aid of horses, Comanche undertook a new brand of guerrilla style warfare and this military tactic was a strategic means of undercutting any advantage that the Spanish would have in hand-to-hand -hand combat. While Comanche warfare appeared random, it was actually highly organized, but it was a temporary system of disciplined units, generals, and captains. Comanche raids were directed by an experienced captain who was elected to be in charge for the duration of that specific campaign. Each Comanche warrior had three to four horses, one of which was his specific war horse that he used in battle. There was also an order to the way in which Comanches marched into war. So you had scouts in the front, then the chief, then the chief, women and children in the back. The rock art panel here offers some evidence of a well-documented Comanche military tactic of surprise encirclement. And we, we know this was very effective because the, there's lots of archival documents where the US cavalry is said to be like completely baffled that the Comanche could come up with something like this. So basically what would happen is this, these small groups of Comanche people would pick a target, come down, catch them by surprise, usually in the middle of the night, encircle them in a kind of rotating fashion, take whatever they needed, 
and then get out of Dodge, usually separating into different kind of smaller units to avoid reprisal and detection. So based on the evidence, it seems that there's a good case to be made that the Comanche actually had a military advantage over the Spanish. The Comanche case demonstrates how indigenous groups were often able to transform the tools of the colonizer into tools of the colonized. They used European steel to make projectile points. They used European horses to develop a new form of warfare. They used European leather to make armor. And they eventually came to own more European guns than the Spanish in New Mexico. It's not looking good for them. Numerical advantage. In the 1620s, the Spanish missionary Fray Alonso de Benavides estimated that the Spanish population in Santa Fe was about 250 people, and about only 50 of them had arms. This population likely remained steady for the remainder of the kind of pre-1680 time period. When the Spanish returned, they encountered a slightly different demographic situation the Comanche population is on the rise. Accompanying the increase in Comanche population was a general decline in the population of the eastern frontier pueblos, as a result primarily of raiding, but also drought. For example, Galisteo Pueblo saw a 50% decrease in its population between 1760 and 1776, and Pecos population declined from 446 to a mere 269 during the same time period. The settler population was similarly limited. It's estimated that in 1680, there were less than 2,400 Spanish in New Mexico. For many Spanish residents in other parts of the empire, New Mexico was a pretty hard sell. It was an unattractive option. It was a fringe settlement on the edge of the world. It had no resources. And it had no prospects for success. New Mexico, what you're seeing here is a graph of New Mexico's demography from this kind of 18th century time period. So what you'll notice is that in the 18th century, the Comanche population is continuing to rise. But you'll also notice that the Spanish population begins to rise, specifically after 1786 when they sign a peace agreement with the Comanche. So the easing of Comanche raiding allowed Spanish settlers to undertake sheep and cattle ranching at a previously unfathomable level. At the, as the Spanish ranching industry expanded, so did the population. In 1790, there were about four towns with over 2,000 Spaniards. Remember, before, there was a total population of about 2,000. By 1800, the Spanish population was estimated to be over 18,000 individuals, and it continues to rise through the rest of the Spanish colonial period. The peace treaty also facilitated growth in the Comanche population, which gradually expanded to a height of about 20,000 people by the turn of the century. So at the same time that the Spanish population is doing great and their economy is expanding under Comanche economic control, the Pueblo markets continue to contract, which is what you're seeing with that orange line there. By the early 19th century, Comanche raiding had directly caused the abandonment of several Pueblo villages, including Pecos, when its remaining 17 residents moved to Jemez Pueblo in 1838. So the demographic data indicates that throughout the 18th century, the Spanish population in New Mexico remained relatively small until a formal peace was established with the Comanche in the late 1700s. In contrast, our best guess using Spanish records is that the Comanche population seems to have grown steadily over the same time period. This suggests that despite the larger total population of the Spanish empire in New Mexico, the demographics were actually in favor of indigenous folks, at least during the 18th century. And we'll get to this in a little bit. OK, let's turn to the issue of centralized decision makers. Diamond's argument here is that Having a centralized bureaucracy allowed Western states to more effectively distribute resources and execute military and diplomatic actions. In the case of 18th century New Mexico, the centralized bureaucracy of the Spanish state significantly weakened their strategic position against the Comanche. And this is on two accounts. First, 
Having a centralized military bureaucracy meant that any time a Comanche raid occurred, you had to send word to Santa Fe. Santa Fe had to get their shit together and send <laughs> soldiers out to these co uh, remote settlements that were already, the Comanche were already long gone. A similar lethargy was encountered with regards to changes in official policy, right? So if I want to change my official policy towards the Comanche, I have to send news all the way to Madrid. And then I have to wait till the king decides what I'm going to do. And then a guy has got to go back to Mexico City, and then he's got to make his way back to Santa Fe. And all that time, the realities have changed on the ground. So centralized bureaucracy actually didn't work too well for New Mexico as a colony. The other big thing is that Comanche society is highly decentralized, and this confounded Spanish officials to no end. They could not understand this. So what you're seeing here is a, the structure of Comanche society, which is comprised of a series of small bands called numucanis, which were linked to particular resources. Individual male leaders within each numucani organized uh, focused activity groups to undertake particular activities, raiding, war, long distance trade. This is all kind of an individual initiative. Geographically close residential groups formed these kind of local bands and were allied under the direct leadership of a popular leader called a paraibo, whose power was earned through military conquest and political charisma. And it was primarily maintained through strategic resources, trade goods, and war spoils. The relationship between these social units was very fluid, with individuals freely moving among camps, activity groups, bands, and divisions according to their specific interests. Although the system was decentralized, they still had kind of regulated periods of large-scale gatherings at where all these political divisions would come together, and they shared a kind of common set of social conventions that made the Comanche a coherent entity. The Numucani are clearly visible in the rock art that we have in the northern Rio Grande. So what you're seeing here is a series of uh, kind of representative panels of teepee panels that we have in the gorge. You can see the, there's different forms of encampment, but what you'll want to notice is the groupings of the teepees within the panels. So for example, in this linear format, you see these kind of three rows of teepees. This would represent one family group, another family group, and a lower family group. Similarly, in the cluster format, you can see these tight groupings of various teepees. Again, in the circle format here, horseshoe circle format, this was primarily used for kind of larger uh, wintertime gatherings. So we can start to get information about when these gatherings would have happened in the northern Rio Grande. So the Comanche used this decentralized system to their advantage. The flexible model of interaction allowed bands to selectively employ, employ raiding and trading in direct response to changes in allies or market demands. Underlying this system was a principle of reciprocity, which provided an important safety valve in times of scarcity. This allowed the Comanche to adapt more quickly to diplomatic and military realities on the ground and to diversify and expand their economic interests. This decentralized system posed a serious challenge to Spanish control, which relied on making one-on-one -on -one connections with individual leaders and having every subject then follow that leader. The Spanish archives are filled with these accounts which lament the apparent kind of duplicity of the Comanche. For example, here in this report from um, Governor Mendoneta to Marquis de Croix, he says, the alternative actions of this nation at the same time, now peace and now war, show forth their unaccustomed faithlessness, either through a premeditated principle of the entire nation or because its captains do not enjoy the superiority necessary to be obeyed. And each individual does what he wants, reconciling himself to enter in peace when he deems it useful, making war when his barbarous nature dictates. Mendoneta is pissed. So Mendoneta's statement reveals an essential disconnect between the Western model of governance, which relied on making deals with clearly identifiable leaders, 
and the Comanche political system. So the argument I want to make here is that Mendonet and other colonial officials, what they interpreted as barbarity or the lack of control of Comanche leaders was actually a strategic part of Comanche geopolitics. Because the Spanish were never effectively able to bridge this gap between their own understanding of a centralized system and the inherently decentralized nature of Comanche society, they failed to ever fully establish control over Comanche actions. Last one. The last criteria under Diamond's four reasons why states usually beat hunter-gatherers is the use of official religion, which inspires a fight to the death. Essentially, Diamond's claim is that the state is capable of inducing in their citizens a brand of patriotic fervor, what he calls a kind of suicidal drive that's impossible to foment with small dis dispersed bands of hunter-gatherers. We don't see hunter-gatherers doing anything like the Pledge of Allegiance. The Spanish Empire, perhaps more than its contemporaries of French and British Empire, drew on religious fervor to justify and inspire their imperial conquests. Christian zeal became a defining feature of Spanish identity during their 700-year struggle against the barbarous Muslim nomadic Moors. So what you're seeing here is actually contemporary images of a La Fiesta de Moros y Cristianos, which is practiced still in Spain, in which everybody gets dressed up and they reenact the Spanish conquest over the Muslim barbarians. So it's still very much a part of Spanish identity. So Spain emerges from this struggle victorious on the eve of Columbus's discovery of America. Spain's colonial project in the New World was fueled by this new identity as Christian conquerors and intimately linked with the Christian duty to convert. Indeed, the first Spanish people to ever show up in New Mexico are Franciscan missionaries. At this time, the mission is a kind of religious, political, and social institution at the heart of the Spanish empire. Missions were places of salvation, they, used, they were used to save Indians from their savagery, and they were also spaces of indoctrination, transforming indigenous people into good little citizens. While it is certainly the case that the Spanish colonization in the Americas was inspired by Christianity, it is not the case that small-scale hunter-gatherers lack the sort of suicidal drive that drives the West. They can be suicidal too. The Comanche is a great example of this. Although the Comanche don't have a kind of institutionalized religion like we might think of in terms of Christianity, they do have a clear ideology, which imagines the world as full of power. And power is something that you can tap into. One of the ways that you can tap into it is through violence. Over the course of the 18th century, violence became an increasingly central feature of Comanche culture. This was not violence for violence's sake. It had an economic and a social component. Economically, Comanche violence allowed them to expand their territorial control. Territory was used as a, a kind of raiding ground. It was used for pasture for horses. It was used as a buffer zone against enemies. And it was a source of slaves and livestock. It also provided an outlet for their commercial goods. Socially, the acquisition of livestock and captives through violence was a means of achieving prestige, which was a necessary step for any young man looking to come up in Comanche society, get himself a wife, become a good provider. He had to commit acts of violence. So what you're seeing here is a rock art panel that depicts a battle between two indigenous groups. What we think is that the Comanche are the ones on the right. And we think that because of this small image here, where you can kind of see this little snake-like image. So the Comanche were typically referred to in plain sign language as snakes. So we see in a lot of Comanche rock art in the Rio Grande Gorge, snake iconography incorporated into Comanche rock art. And we see them advancing onto another small encampment up here. The development of a formal system of graded war honors kind of fueled the suicidal drive of the Comanche warriors to expand their territory. 
according to the system, various deeds in combat had different ranks, and they needed to be documented. Different deeds received different weights, and these weights largely determine a man's individual status. So there's two general categories of war honors, counting coup, which is basically when you touch something, like touching an enemy's hand or an object, as you see here in this rock art panel, where you see a kind of equestrian warrior here reaching out and touching his enemy with a spear. There was also taking something. So this could be anything, taking a life, taking a gun, taking horses, taking a scalp. That was the other main form of war honor. So the documentation of bravery in combat on rocks served as a kind of public service announcement that said an individual had successfully completed a military task. While there was certainly a growing level of competition for brave deeds, this system also encouraged restraint. Don't worry, it wasn't a never-ending escalating scale to violence. Counting coup encouraged attackers to kill one or two enemies and then quickly exit before suffering casualties. If you die, you don't get anything. You lose. <laughs> Here's another example of counting coup from the northern Rio Grande. So skirmishes on horseback often quickly moved into close contact fighting and hand-to-hand -hand battles with clubs and lances and bows. These hand-to-hand -hand battles were actually offered greater chances for men to distinguish themselves in action. So what you're seeing here, this is one single uh, rock art panel. What you're seeing here is they use the kind of natural line of the rock to divide up the panel. And you can see a battle here on the lower side. You can see the battle is against a, a numerous level of Comanche warriors and then one tiny little Spanish soldier down here. And he's on his horse. And we know he's Spanish because of a couple things. One, he's got a funny hat. He has this kind of typical metal style uh, hat, which we see um, often Spanish soldiers were wearing in the 18th century. And he also has this classic hand on hip posture. And this is like a standard way of depicting conquistador. You can just go look, Google conquistador and you'll see every picture has him with his hand on his hip. It's a, it's a power move. But in this, in this story, the person with the power is this guy up here, because he's the warrior who emerges victorious from the battle. Here we have another example of counting coup. This is a more kind of typical way we might think of coup being counted, and this is a kind of accumulation of tallies. We're not really sure what the tallies would stand for, but accumulation of tallies either through kills or horses taken, and then what looks like scalps taken as well. So the argument that I want to make here is that power and violence for the Comanche functioned in a similar way to Christian fervor for the Spanish. Violence was both a tool of conquest and an ideology. It was a driving force behind Comanche expansion, and it instilled in Comanche men a profound desire to undertake violent military acts. So this suicidal fervor is perhaps best illustrated by the practice of staking. So this is a practice that we see among other Plains groups, where basically a warrior would stake himself into the ground, and he would basically be saying he would not retreat from the battle. So the only two outcomes are either he's still alive or he's dead. But he wasn't going to retreat. If that's not suicidal fervor, I don't know what is. <laughs> So looking at the evidence of guns and steel, I think it's fair to say that there's pretty good evidence to indicate that the Spanish state may have failed on several accounts. So in the remaining time that I have, I want to turn briefly to the issue of germs. According to Diamond, germs, by which he basically means infectious disease, were a kind of potent cocktail produced by human interactions in the old world with old world uh, domesticates like pigs and cows and the rise of densely populated cities. It was through germs that the European colonists were able to kind of fix the numbers game in their favor, letting their superior technology pretty much do the rest. So in an effort to avoid a kind of slippery slope of alt facts, I want to acknowledge the fact that the Comanche population was in fact devastated by several waves of European disease. 
In the first half of the 19th century, the Comanche were hit by a series of smallpox epidemics. In 1851, the U.S. government estimated that the Comanche population had dropped from the height of 20,000 to a mere 12,000. In 1862, and then again in 1867, cholera hit the Comanche population in New Mexico. By 1870, the Comanche numbered 8,000, a, popu a population estimate pretty close to what we think they were at the beginning of the 18th century. If we follow Diamond's logic, it seems that there was nothing the Comanche could have done. They were betrayed by their own genetics, as we all are, which lacked immunity and resistance to old world germs. According to this story, germs are universally disliked non-human scapegoat that caused the downfall of the new world. Who could be mad at a germ? Diamond's narrative leaves one with a helpless feeling that the Comanche's days were basically numbered from the moment their story begins. It was only a matter of time before some germs got them, Spanish, American, eventually it would cut, catch up to them. This sort of nihilism obscures the adaptability of indigenous people. Instead, I would like to present an alternative story a story of strategic resistance and resilience, a persistence represented by the over 16,000 Comanche tribal members that live today. This story explains why, in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds, there are so many Comanche people today. The Comanche's persistence, despite these devastating impacts of European germs, can be attributed to two things strategic mobility, and genetic diversification. Comanche strategic mobility in the face of disease is really captured in their own origin story. So this story was told to me by Comanche tribal member Catherine Tijerina, and it goes like this. The Comanche and Shoshone were once one people. At some point, there was a terrible disease, and the medicine people didn't know how to treat it. They don't know what it was, they don't know what it was called, but it caused paralysis. So they think maybe it was polio. And it was killing people. And the Comanches were afraid. And the Shoshone were afraid. So the first, for the first time in their history, instead of being one people, they split. They decided that it would be better for the Shoshone to move north and for the Comanche to move south. And that was the way to beat the disease. As the Comanche moved south, they ran into the horse. According to Tijerina's story, the Comanche's ethnogenesis is centered on adaption to disease. The Comanche as a separate ethnic entity would not exist without germs. This suggests that germs are not only destructive, but they're actually generative. The other big takeaway from the Comanche origin story is movement. There's a good argument here to be made that one of the key reasons why the Comanche were able to flourish during this time when other indigenous societies were decreasing in population was because of their mobility. Mobility allowed the Comanche to avoid one of the most devastating features of infectious disease, the rapid spread in close populations. Unlike densely populated sedentary villages where disease could spread quickly from one host to the next, the Comanche lived in dispersed bands. The effect of this social structure was that infectious diseases remained isolated, negatively impacting only one small portion of the population as opposed to the entire population. Indeed, if we take a closer look, one of the key factors in the devastating impact of disease on the Comanche during the 19th century was the increasing consolidation of Comanche people onto reservations. It's only when Americans start to force Comanche people onto reservations where they no longer have mobility as a safety valve for preventing the spread of infectious disease that we see the devastating tolls on the population that we've witnessed during the mid 18th, 19th century. In addition to strategic mobility, genetic diversification was likely a key factor in the Comanche's persistence. Captive taking is a deeply ingrained feature of Comanche culture. Indeed, the Comanche Empire was in many ways built on the back of slaves. 
a key commodity in trade markets across the Southern Plains, Spanish, Apache, and Navajo captives were exchanged for grains, horses, guns, etc. Although violent, Comanche captive taking was profoundly different from chattel slavery. Captors were fully integrated into Comanche society through adoption or marriage, becoming equal participants in the economic, political, and religious activities of the particular band that had captured them. Probably the best example of this, some of you might know, Cynthia Ann Parker. Captured in 1836 by the Comanche uh, Quahada band, that's the Buffalo Eaters, eventually, she eventually married an up-and-coming young man named Peka Nakona, and they had three children, one of them who is Kwana Parker, the last Comanche chief, who it turns out is actually the first Comanche chief because the Comanches didn't have chiefs. <laughs> In 1860, Parker was returned to Anglo society against her will, and she tried several times to run away from her uncle's home in Texas. Eventually, her, young, her youngest daughter and her husband were both killed. After this, Parker went into a deep depression, and she began to self-impose starvation on herself. She eventually died of influenza in 1870. Parker's story is a great example of just how integrated white settlers and other captives were in Comanche society. It's important to note that Comanche uh, captive taking wasn't just a one-way street. It wasn't just Comanches going out and taking captives. They were also captives. Over the course of the 18th century, an increasing number of Comanches became integrated into Spanish and Pueblo homes as servants captured during slave raids by some of their enemy tribes, particularly the Navajo. This genetic entanglement is marked by the growing number of Hanisero. Native cap Hanisero is a term for native captives who are then sold to Spaniards. There's an increasing number of Hanisero settlements that start to appear in the archaeological record over the course of the 18th century, including settlements like San Miguel del Bado, Ranchos de Taos, and Abiquiu, which you see depicted here. These Hanisero settlements became kind of central hubs for Comanche raiding and trading activities. So the argument that I want to put forward here is that the Comanche increased their ability to weather European germs by diversifying their own genetic makeup. By undoing those genetic advantages that the old world had and actually making them their own. And this was accomplished through captive taking. So, at the beginning of this talk, I set out to answer the question, why and when did indigenous groups triumph over the West? In answering this question, I have looked to the Comanche as an example of an indigenous society that challenges these kind of general interpretations of the West is the best. Through a combination of guerrilla style warfare, numerical strength, economic control of essential resources like horses and guns, decentralization, military fervor, and genetic diversification, the Comanche were not only able to resist. This isn't a story of resistance. This is a story of Comanche domination. They actually controlled a vast territory stretching from the Arkansas River Valley down to the Balcones Escarpment, and they held control of that territory for 100 years, even more. Now, you may be thinking, this is all well and good, but doesn't the Comanche case simply prove that they're exceptional? Not that Diamond is wrong? And the answer is yes. <laughs> In many ways, Diamond narrative is correct. The Comanche, just like hundreds of other indigenous groups in America, eventually were forced onto reservations. They suffered incredible population loss, and they continue to suffer from a serious in series of intergenerational traumas as a result of Western colonialism. Meanwhile, the rest of American society has seemed to move on and progress. While all this is true, it's not really the point that I want to make here. The point I want to make here is that up until now, recently, popular books, academic books, have told a story of Western success. This has been a talk to move in the opposite direction, a move in favor of alternative stories and alternative perspectives. 
This alternative perspective means taking a more critical look at events like the Battle of San Diego Pond. Instead of another story of Western military triumph, the battle appears to be an exception to the rule. One of those rare instances where the Spanish actually caught up to the Comanche and were able to bring them into their own style of combat. Ultimately, what I hope you guys walk away from this talk thinking is that you have a new desire to search for different stories. Those stories of indigenous success and those stories of indigenous persistence, one of which you can see here in this picture of Comanche tribal members visiting the Vista Verde site that you just saw all that rock art from. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? You can yell at me, tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> Well, the ultimate result is perhaps bad luck. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, in, in many ways, th there's kind of, for much of the Spanish colonial period, uh, you know, the 1700s up until 1821, the story is overwhelmingly in favor of the Comanche, as well as other indigenous societies. Comanche are exceptional in their role in New Mexico, but other indigenous societies are doing similar things elsewhere. The real turning point starts to be when American colonizers come in. And this is, brings in this new influx of disease, which really starts to set things on a, um, a negative path. There's a, it's also not just the Americans that cause the Comanche kind of polity to start to collapse. One of the other big factors that we see happening is a series of kind of environmental issues, like a series of droughts that start to happen, which really put pressure on the pasturage for Comanche horses and mules. And this really prevents them from continuing to expand their horse herds, which is a central feature of their economy. The other big thing is actually an indigenous force, because there's various different indigenous groups in the region, particularly the Pawnee and the Tonkas, who begin to challenge Comanche control at the fringes of their empire. And these, this is a very similar story to what we see happening with a lot of Western empires, right? The Roman Empire begins to collapse, not just because of bad luck, but because they keep getting attacked from the fringes of the empire, and their centralized bureaucracy becomes so top-heavy that they can't handle it anymore. In a very similar way, the Comanche story is not just a, a only bad luck. It's definitely bad luck. But it's also these other forces. Some, some of those forces are indigenous, not just Western. Do, do Comanche people today have a narrative, a story of what happened between that origin story you told us and, and now? Do they have a history? Well, there is no, um, you know, in the, in the West, we like, we like our big um, kind of overarching narratives that kind of tell the whole story of us. There's not really a story like that for the Comanche, but there are lots of stories that are kind of imbued in places, stories about individual battles or individual events that we can use to start to piece together, if that's our interest, we can use that to start to piece together a bigger narrative of what the Comanche look like. And a lot of the uh, stories that I'm telling you are stories that Comanche people have told me and perspectives that they uh, believe in. I mean, they. They firmly believe their story is that, yeah, we were badasses <laughs> in a lot of ways. That is their, that is their kind of story. One of the interesting things that I thought of about your talk is that the nomadic nature of the Comanche was so important. And yet, when you think about the evolution of societies and culture, it's usually when you stop being nomadic, yeah. that those cultures and societies tend to advance. I right. think that's an interesting juxtaposition there. Yeah, I think it, it kind of, we've, we've set out this, um, this narrative, this is our common received wisdom, that basically we kind of advanced through a series of stages in one direction. And we started out as 
hunter-gatherers, and then we moved along the chain to arrive at the civilization that we have today. Now, the problem with that is that the people who made up that evolution were only Westerners, and they were looking at their own society, as, as is only natural, right? If I'm a Western anthropologist going out into the world, I say, what do I know about me? And then how do all these other people stack up against it? And so that's what's happening, right? These, these kind of narratives of complexity that Diamond is drawing on is coming out of this kind of colonial history that's unique to the West. So before, we don't really, this is not really a thing that exists in the world, in people's minds, until people, Europeans start to go out into the world and discover other people who are not like them. And they start to say, how can I categorize these people? And one of the main ways that they used uh, to justify the conquest of people was to say, well, they're less good. They're inferior, and therefore, I have a right to conquer them. This is the logic of manifest destiny. So I mean, in many ways, like this is a narrative that we're told because it's the narrative that we came up with. But it's not necessarily true. And that's really the point, is that there's alternative pathways to complexity. You don't have to be agricultural to be complex. You don't have to be agricultural to develop technologies. I mean, the Comanche are a great example of this. They, weren't, they didn't have pottery, but they made some pretty awesome horse armor. That, that's really the point, is that we're trying to kind of break away from these linear narratives that really are a story that we tell ourselves, not necessarily a story that's objectively true. You know, talking about alternative explanations, I mean, you could look at this as just indigenous bullets, the history of bullets. <laughs> and from that network, it would be nice if you looked at what's the relationship between the Comanche historically and, and views with the Plains of Passy, Kiowa, Caddo, Wichita, and their neighbors. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so in, in general, uh, the Comanche are, they don't have, Great, uh, they're not on great terms with the Apaches in general. Um, I mean, they're, in Indian country, these kind of old school animosities kind of linger. And we all, it's now kind of a joke, but it's kind of serious. It's like everybody has jokes about, oh, you don't want to invite that Cheyenne person here, or, you know, things like that, which are really reflective of these kind of longer histories of interaction. And so the same thing exists for the Comanche with various neighboring um, groups, particularly the Pueblos is a great example. Pueblo people in, in many ways disliked the Comanche and continue to dislike the Comanche. They kind of say like, well, where are they now? <laughs> but, but in many ways, they also have very intimate ties with the Comanche. Uh, if you guys saw my um, Southwest Archaeology Center uh, cafe talk, I talked a lot about how the Pueblos do this Comanche dance, which is um, very much a kind of Pueblo dance, but is based on the Comanche. So they, they have these kind of intimate ties. So some of the reason why it's so intimate is because of intermarriage and captive taking. But they also have these historic, deep-rooted animosities. Yeah, so I mean, in many ways, yeah, the Comanche are just like, they're just big bullies, just, just mean. But, but, and they're still kind of perceived in that way among contemporary indigenous folks. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Yeah, so um, the whole kind of issue of Hniseros, right? These, these um, native captives who grew up in Spanish households is a great example of this kind of intermingling of identities that starts to happen on the northern frontier. People are starting to become very interested in how these kind of identities start to form and, and where we draw the lines between them. And it turns out that you can't do it. You can't really draw clear lines. We can't create 
us archaeologists, we love to create like little bounded categories around things, but you can't do that with identity. And so what, what we're starting to see is just how messy these kind of interrelationships were. Messy depending on what household you ended up with, what band you came from, and all sorts of nuances um, of, of the kind of experience that you would have had as a captive. So in many cases, uh, Spanish captives who went out to live with the Comanche never came back. Others fled the first opportunity that they got. So it's not, there's no kind of um, one way street in that regard. It was, all, it was all very messy and their identities were all very um, intermingled. Now if you listen to the kind of classic story of Spanish identity, and this has been a story that's been told for the, until very recently, is that Hanisaros don't exist. They don't exist. Because either you're Spanish or you're not. You're either Spanish or indigenous. This has created the kind of trifecta identity that you see in New Mexico, where you're either Anglo, Spanish, or indigenous. But there's a lot of research now that's starting to show that that's not actually true. So I think we're starting to get at those narratives that you're talking about, but we haven't really figured it out. There, I, I don't have any good answers. <laughs> yeah. Is there a parallel that you could draw with the history of Mexico? Mm -hmm. The mestizos, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is considered a majority of Mexicans, which is complex mm -hmm. intermarriage and conquest and uh, the whole business. You still have Indios, yeah. but you have mestizos and you have the Spanish class. Elite, yeah. And it's really complicated. Yeah. Is that somewhat parallel to what's going on in the Mexican history? It is, except it's even more messy because we don't know how many of the people who were coming up into New Mexico were actually these Spanish elites and how much of them were actually indigenous or mestizo people themselves. So, and, it, and it's starting to look like a lot of them were mestizo. So the Hispano people that we think of in New Mexico are actually really mestizo people. But then they mix with their, their own, like the unique brand of indigenous groups that are kind of stewing around in the northern Rio Grande. And so then we end up with also, nobody knows who anybody is. <laughs> the caste system can't handle it. <laughs> I mean, these kind of deep-seated traditions continue on today in many ways. I mean, we see continued uh, use of traditional kind of um, healing ceremonies, especially for Native people who have decided to enlist in war, and coming back and, and using the same kind of techniques that their ancestors did hundreds of years ago as a way to reground themselves and to re-enter the community. So we see, the, we see it on lots of different scales um, that kind of continuity. And it's not to say that things don't change. That, that would be silly. Who, who among us would expect people not to change? But that doesn't mean that they become unauthentic or un, uh, un-Indian because they've changed. But what I mean, really what this narrative is about, is about is the persistence. But persistence with adaptability, that's really the story of indigenous people in the Americas. Everywhere you look in the United States, New England, Northwest, Southwest Pacific, it doesn't matter. 
terms as the downfall of the indigenous people. In fact, if you go around the world, it seems like Europeans are play carriers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this is one of um, this is actually one of the questions that Jared Diamond addresses in his book. He says, "Why didn't it happen the other way around? Why didn't Native people have diseases and just give it right back to them?" But one of the explanations that he comes up with is that um, basically, disease Native diseases, one they didn't have the type of infectious diseases that Europeans had, and there's various reasons for that. One of the reasons is that. They never had these kind of, um, they never domesticated the types of animals that carry diseases like they have in the old world. So pigs and cows are one of these main uh, early domesticates in the old world that were carriers of infectious disease. In the new world, we don't have that. The only domesticates that we have are llamas, turkeys, those sorts of things, dogs, and those don't carry infectious diseases. So one of the reasons is because of the types of domesticates that were in the New World versus the Old World. They just, Native people just didn't, we weren't diseased. We just didn't have diseases. Uh, another big one is the fact that they weren't kind of settled in these kind of um, densely populated um, urban centers which allowed infectious diseases to spread rapidly. And if you listen to Jared Diamond's argument, he says the reason why infectious diseases don't spread rapidly in the New World is a simple matter of geography. The North and South American continents are much more spread out, so diseases can't get from here to there that quickly. They die out. They, do, they lose hosts. Whereas in Eurasia, we have these kind of huge, densely populated centers that are all very close to each other. And so you can just hop from city to city, bumping around, giving everybody cholera. <laughs> I would also wonder if perhaps the, you know, we wiped, our germs wiped out everybody is part of the story that comes from the Western storytelling tradition. Yeah. Because I do believe there have been plenty of Westerners who were taken down by malaria in foreign countries and many diseases in Africa that we're still learning names for yeah. that we don't even know about and understand that wipe out people who visit them and we yeah. don't even know what they are. Malaria is probably the closest thing that you have as um, creating an epidemic on a large scale um, that affected European colonizers that wasn't indigenous to Europe itself. And it is definitely a, a, the story that we tell ourselves is that infectious disease wiped everybody else, right? Because then we get to feel good. It's not us, we didn't do it. The germs did it. <laughs> it, it but it is like, it is, it's definitely a part of the story that we kind of tell ourselves about why we were su so successful. And, and Jared Diamond uh, actually says, you know, the conquistadors didn't really do much at all. He says that. They didn't do much at all. It was really the germs that did all the work for them. And then they just swooped in, took all the glory. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.